If you're a producer, learning how to master gives you complete sonic control over your entire song. It means you don't have to rely on an external mastering engineer and it makes you a better music producer overall. So if you wanna dive into the skill of mastering, today we're gonna to cover nine crucial tips you need to know. So tip one is that you need to understand your loudness target. Now in electronic music genres, this is gonna be different for very different subgenres, but uh, it's good to pull in a few tracks of your favorite style and see where the average kind of luffs hits. Now, if you need to know what luffs is, check the link in the description for an article all about it that I wrote a while back. I've got this um, template up here and I've got a compare channel, which is where I'm gonna put my reference track. And what I'm gonna do is it's gonna send to the master and I've got a few tools loaded up here. Now, one of them is Ulean Loudness Meter 2, which is a free loudness metering plugin. You can bring this up and run your reference tracks through it so you can see where they average out in terms of loudness. So I'm gonna run Glue by Bicep here because I'm gonna be doing a breakbeat sort of track and let's see where we land. Okay, so about negative 11. Let's see if we can get to a bit of a louder part. So it seems we're hitting about negative nine at an absolute maximum there. It's good to know between 11 and nine is kind of good for this style. Uh, for a different style, it's gonna be different. The other tool you can use uh, is if you have this tool reference by mastering the mix, you can actually uh, compare your LUFs here with your reference tracks LUFs here. This tool also BPM matches it to whatever your host tempo is. So that's one thing to be aware of, but it's a pretty cool handy tool that I use as well. Now, real quick, um, this mastering template I'm using here is actually from our brand new course mastering for producers that we did with Nick DiLorenzo of Panorama Mastering. It's an insane course that teaches you how to take your music for like from 90% to 100% and it goes deep into all the technicalities of mastering so that you can quickly churn out high quality masters for yourself without having to go through someone else. So if you wanna sign up, we're actually doing a 30% off launch discount this week only till next Tuesday. I'll leave a link for that in the description. Okay, so number two is you need to develop your ear. Now this is an absolutely crucial thing that you need to focus on if you're wanting to become a decent enough mastering engineer so you can do your own tracks. Now you're gonna develop your ear the more you produce in general, the more you mix, but the key with mastering is here, you need to learn how to listen to your music as an overall product rather than the sum of the individual elements. You're not thinking of drums and bass anymore, you're thinking of the low end, the mid range, the high end, and how those frequencies are being portrayed by what is coming through there. Now, there's a few great tools that I've used in the past. The Pro Audio Essentials by Isotope are great. They're free. Uh, you basically have an equalization compression and then like a digital audio basics lesson, which is more theory. Uh, but basically the EQ and the compression ones are insanely good for hearing the effects of say a 1 dB boost here or like a 2 dB cut there. Uh, you've also got Sound Gym. Now I love Sound Gym. These guys are great. They're good friends of ours actually. Uh, theirs is like a paid uh, subscription. There's a few free tools you can use however though, but theirs goes even deeper in my opinion. You know, EQ mirror, compressionist, stereo, balance memory. So you learn how to balance faders, which is even more important. I mean, this is more for mixing at this point, but you get the point. All these are gonna help you not only develop yourself as an engineer side of things, mixing and mastering, but specifically with mastering as well. But the best thing to do in a mastering context in order to develop your ear is make changes that are more drastic at start and then rein them back. So I'm gonna bring in my pre-master here now, uh, which is a track I'm working on called Warm Blue. It's kind of a breakbeaty type track that I've been working on, something a bit different to my normal drum and bass stuff. And I'm gonna run this through my mastering chain, which it's set to go through the sends here. I've got the um, A mastering chain turned off. It's just going through B here at negative 2.8. So I'm giving it a bit of headroom. Really nice kind of vibey breakbeat stuff. But let's, um, I've got this EQ here that I've actually scaled back. I want you to hear it at 100% and then see how scaling it back brings it back to normal. So let's bring this up to 100. I'm gonna scale it up a bit more. Back to 100. Nothing there.
And you're basically just looking for like a nice sweet spot where you can hear the effect a bit still, but not quite fully drastic. And this is a great way to make sure you're mastering intentionally, but you're not doing it, overdoing it too much. This is also a great point I'm gonna get into later in the video. So stick around for the full thing. But if you've got any other great methods for developing your ears, make sure you leave them in the comments because I'd love to hear them as well. Okay, tip three, you need a great limiter. Now the stock limiters in most DAWs, unfortunately the one department where I just haven't found a door with a good stock limiter. Logix is probably the closest, but still it just doesn't have that transparency and cleanness that you can get from great limiters. Now, my personal favorite is the FabFilter Pro L2, particularly the transparent and modern algorithms. The Isotope Ozone Maximizer, particularly in nine with the IRC4 modern mode is probably the next best in my opinion. That's a great option too, but I'm gonna be using Pro L today just because I absolutely love it. And I'm gonna bring my uh, gain down here to zero. Basically in this chain, we've just got stereo imaging stuff, EQ, mid side EQ, bringing up the side channel a bit, bit of parallel compression, multiband compression, clipping with the glue compressor and then limiting. So that's my chain. It's a lot, but it's actually all very intentional stuff. And I'm just gonna show you the effects of a great limiter by just bringing up this gain here. And just, you can hear that I can drive this thing without it distorting or pumping too much, especially on this transparent mode. So let's go ahead and see how this works. It's only around here that we're starting to actually hear like these minor artifacts, but it's doing a really good job of holding up. Okay, so you can start to hear it around 9 dB there. It's not sounding that great, but still it's holding up the integrity as best as it can. So you can push these things really well especially if you're using oversampling, the appropriate attack and release, which allows it to kind of mold to the material the best, and mostly just using a great sounding algorithm like the transparent one, as I mentioned. So I highly recommend you invest in a good limiter because it will save you time, money, everything down the line. Now there's a bunch of other great limiters we've mentioned on our blog, our writer Simon uh, did an article way back in the day. So go check that out if you want even more recommendations. Okay, so tip four is to fix it in the mix. Now this isn't actually a mastering tip as much as it is like something to be aware of before you master. Nothing you can do in mastering is gonna be better than something you could have done in the mix. So if you can have like an 80% finish track or a 95% finish track when you come into mastering, I'm always opting for the 95% finish track because it's just a way better way to work, let's be honest. Now, a lot of the common mix problems that mastering engineers or if you are mastering your own music that you'll run into are like fader balancing. 90% of the time it's fader balancing. If you can fader balance, basically it's EQ for your entire mix and it's gonna make mastering way easier. So in terms of our pre-master here, there's a few things about it that I don't like. What I'm gonna do here is actually just turn off all my mastering. I'm just gonna group them in here and into a rack. So you'll be able to hear it dry for a second. Okay, so the things I'm noticing in this track is that the sides on that main synth are just too loud. Uh, also, the drums are probably a bit too transient and there's not enough body to them. Uh, these are things that I could probably fix in the mix before bringing them into mastering. Also, the bass is a bit too heavy in the low end I'm finding for this style, like just the tiniest bit too loud, especially with the kick. So those kind of things are things that you should go back then into your project. I'd go back into the original uh, project where I mixed it or produced it, fix those things, export it again, and bring it back in so you'll save yourself a headache. And if your mixing skills aren't up to scratch, we also have a separate course called Mixing for Producers, which goes deep on the mixing side of things. So check that out too. Okay, number five is to make sure you master on a different day. This is a really simple one because if you've been mixing for a while and then you jump straight into mastering, your ears are not prepared for the switch it requires to get into a mastering mindset. Because again, you're going from individual elements to the full picture. So my recommendation is to at least take a day, schedule a different session in your calendar for mastering. At the very least, give yourself a few hours gap so you let your ear fatigue recover. Then you can master with a clean perspective on your music. So if you're finding these tips helpful, I heard experts recommend that 99% of producers who like this video 
will end up making banging masters. It's just like a guaranteed scientific fact. So if you want to do that, just hit the like button right now. I, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Okay, number six, the best processing is no processing. So what do I mean by that? Basically, what I mean is less is more. Don't do unnecessary stuff. And you can actually hear, I've got two mastering chains here. And you'll see why I switch, chose one over the other. Uh, I'm going to AB between both of them. And let me see if you can hear the difference. Sorry for the little glitch there. That was just the latency switching over between the two channels. Basically, A sounds squashed, a bit too mid-range, you know, gluey. Uh, and B sounds more open, simple, and louder. Uh, and I'm actually using less plugins on B. A, I'm using a combination of like analog compression or analog style compression and saturation to kind of give, I thought it would give the pre-master some more warmth but it actually ended up kind of dulling the low end too much for me. And it also kind of squashed it unnecessarily too much, this 3A, even though it wasn't working very much. You can see it's only doing one or two uh, dB of, you know, I think it's uh, VU meter, so like average loudness. Uh, it still sounded squashed to me. So I deleted them. I actually eased back the EQ. This is the old one here. You can see it's still on 100%. Uh, I deleted... Uh, a few things. I actually eased back this parallel compression a bit more on the other version. Uh, I eased back the multiband compression, changed the EQ. So there's a few things that I did differently and it, it resulted in less processing, but a better result. And I actually ended up kind of relying on the limiter and the glue compressor, which is doing a clipper at the end to compensate. And using the tools I already had actually ended up getting a better result. So, and it all boils down to this really, are you using a plugin to solve a problem or are you using a plugin to justify its existence in your plugin library? Just think on that a moment. I think it's worth considering. Now, one helpful piece of processing you can use on your masks is compression. And I've used a bit here with some uh, parallel compression and stuff like that, multiband compression. If you wanna understand compression a little bit better, a bit more visually, make sure to check out our compression cheat sheet. I'll leave a link for that in the description because that can really help you, uh, you know, understand the different controls, the different views you'll come across on a variety of different compressors that you can apply no matter what tool you're using. Number seven is another bit of kind of more practical oversight, which is not to hyper-focus. Uh, there's so many elements of mastering. It helps to not get bogged down in one corner of it. Remember, as someone who's mastering your own music, at this point, you should have fixed a lot of those things in the mix. Over-the-top surgical processing is not really what you want to be doing here. But if you do find yourself fixating on, say, the low end and trying to fix that, you can do a few things. So a few tools I personally use is hot corners. Basically, if I move my cursor here into the bottom right corner, my screen will turn black and then I won't be able to see anything. That allows me just to listen to what I'm doing without seeing any of the tools I'm using. Great little hack if you're on Mac. A few other things is you can just literally grab your phone, uh, set like, I don't know, five minute timer, press start, work on one element. Once that timer goes off, you'll be reminded that you need to move on to the next part. And then also just to take breaks. If your session is going longer than an hour, uh, you basically need to take a break, let your ears recover a bit, come back to it with a fresh set of ears, and maybe you'll realize all the processing you were doing was a bit pointless and futile anyway. And speaking of breaks, subscribe break. Do a subscription button press now. Number eight, it's probably better to master on headphones. And I am 100% fully committed, honest, believe this is true. This is going to make some people angry uh, because people have invested a lot of money, a lot of time into like treating their room. This is something I knew intuitively for a long time, but no one had really said it to me. And then when I heard it from a few mastering engineer friends, namely Nick, who did mastering for producers with us, clicked for me because I master way better when I'm on headphones. And yes, you can argue you don't get the full stereo representation and stuff like that when you're on, you know, as if you're on monitors. But if your room is under 1500 square feet, you need to treat your room so much that it's not worth it to do it. And you're better off getting a good pair of headphones. The main thing is you use a pair, you know, like these aren't even mastering headphones, but I know them so well. If I was to start again, I would be using a pair of open backs like the Sennheiser's uh, HD 600s or the Bayer Dynamic um, DT 1990s, a great open back headphones that don't let the bass get trapped in like the ones I've got on. But again, like it's about knowing your tools here and having at least a good pair uh, is helpful. So if you want like a good recommendation of 
uh, production headphones in general, head to the description because I've got another article there as well. Okay, so number nine to wrap this all up is the 10% rule. Now my friend at church who's an audio engineer actually taught me this uh, when we were mixing one time. And basically he said, do what you're gonna do, but bring it back by 10%. Because this kind of, again, avoids that over-processing that you can do in mastering. So this could look very different for very different ways. On my mastering chain here, for example, it involved adding some stereo effects in parallel, uh, but then bringing it down a bit so that they're not fully intense. EQing, but bringing it back, in this case, by 75%. Uh, but, you know, again, it's not the full spectrum, so we can actually hear back to the original and back to the process version and kind of find a midway point between the two. Uh, you know, in, in the case of, you know, expanding the uh, the side channel, it could be, okay, maybe this EQ is a bit too crazy. Maybe I can scale this one back as well, you know, gain scale, or perhaps not boost the width too much, you know, bring that back a bit. Or in this case of parallel compression, bring the dry wet back a bit further, or even the threshold back and the makeup gain back a bit further. Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Bring the limiting back a few dB, you know? All of these things you want to do to avoid over-processing. And if you do a little bit of this at each stage, you can go from like a, a globbled mess of music to like a really pristine sounding master because tiny changes at each step will preserve the original song a little more, bringing it back a bit so that uh, the original mix shines through still and you're not ruining the songs. And that is nine crucial tips for mastering your own music. If you like this kind of stuff, remember to check out Mastering for Producers. It's done by a professional mastering engineer that we worked with, Nick DiLorenzo. He knows even more than I do at mastering because he's been doing it by himself for years. He's mastered over 3000 projects and he goes way deeper into all this kind of stuff. So make sure you check that out while the sale's still on. If you're watching this in the future, you can still sign up. You can just click the link in the description. And with that, I'll see you all in the next video. Have a good one, guys.